Let us pray. O oh Lord, on a snowy morning when many of us have been digging out the snow and plowing driveways, we now come to worship and we thank you that we are here to be fed and nourished, strengthened and sustained in your word and meal. Lord, lead us by your forgiveness that we may truly deepen today in the, mag in the magnitude of your grace for us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I attended a conference some years ago on the topic of forgiveness. The speaker said that the one thing that makes forgiveness so difficult is this. We love to be right. There's nothing more that we love than being right. And then he went on to say, now if you don't believe me, I have a little test for you. Get married. <laughs> and of course we laughed. And, but it's true, and not only in marriage, but in all relationships in life. We come up against our impatience, our sin, our shortcomings in ourselves and in the other. And forgiveness is needed again and again and again. Forgiveness is today's topic in our God story. And how important and relevant this is and how necessary it is in our lives. In fact, perhaps as you've heard the word forgiveness, saw it on the screen, maybe there's a person, a place, a situation, either currently or in the past that has come to mind for you. Somebody maybe who granted you forgiveness or who did not give you forgiveness when you needed it. Or maybe somebody you know of a time when you needed and you gave that forgiveness to another. I mean, it's just so crucial to the health, to our health, to our wholeness as individuals, as a church community, as, as, as nations. I preached on this gospel of forgiveness just a few days after the first anniversary of 9-11. So this was in September 2002. And in that sermon, I mentioned how just a few days prior on 9-11, I attended an interfaith prayer service at St. Mary's Cathedral in downtown St. Cloud. And at that interfaith prayer service, Bishop Kinney, who was the bishop at that time of the St. Cloud Catholic Diocese, gave the reflection. And his words were so insightful and profound. He said this, not only is evil destructive, but it also can be contagious. We must never let evil transform us, but rather for God's mercy and God's grace to transform us. Justice needs to be served, indeed, he went on. But it ought never be a hidden form of revenge and retaliation and hatred. I thought he stated it, and his words were so right on. We must never let evil transform us, but rather God's forgiveness mercy and grace to be that transformative power in our lives. What will transform us in life? Will it be that kind of payback, get back, get even mentality, retaliation, or the power of God's mercy and forgiveness? Today's God story declares it clearly and boldly. It is God's wildly generous and lavish forgiveness that empowers us and transforms us to forgive others freely, generously, lavishly. Now in today's God story, Matthew 18, Peter actually thinks he's being quite generous when he asks that question of Jesus. So Jesus, if a member sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times. 
or another translation can often read not seven times, but 70 times seven times. But the point being that it's beyond calculation. It's unlimited. There is no scorekeeping in this new way of life. And forgiveness is the very heart, the very essence of the gospel. And to make that point, Jesus then launches into this parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. It's a parable of the unmerciful servant. And as that king is going to settle to the disputes, comes to that first one, and I didn't get into all the calculations with the kids, but that first slave, it said, owed the king 10,000 talents. Well, now get this. One talent was worth more than 15 years of the typical daily wage. So you take, do the math, 10,000 times 15 years. I mean, we're talking about an indebtedness of over 150,000 years of salary. I mean, it, it's just inconceivable, the magnitude. And when the, the slave realized it's going to be sold at the auction and family possession, please have mercy, and the king forgives all that debt. Huh, gone. And of course, as we know, that slave goes to the fellow slave who owns just this little bit, 100 denarii. Now that was worth about three months of a, a, a typical wages. Somebody has estimated it. To make this more understandable, this second sum of 100 denarii represents over half a million times less than the first debt. And of course, that one asks for mercy, same words, have patience, I'll pay you. But that first servant refuses, throws him in prison. King finds out angry, comes to him, says, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? I mean, the point is clear. We have received this magnitude of grace, grace upon grace from God to lavishly live in that forgiveness with others as we have first been forgiven. Now, in Greek, the New Testament was written originally in Greek. And in Greek, there is no special word for forgive or forgiveness. It simply comes from a Greek verb, a fiemi, which means to let go, to release. That, that's forgive, to let go. But when we talk about this letting go, we need to be clear as to what it is not. Because when there's abuse, it does not mean, oh, we'll let it go. No, that is a distortion of forgiveness. Or when there is bad behavior, destructive behavior, it does not mean that we say, oh, we'll let it go, we'll let it go. No. There is confrontation needed then. There is accountability. There's a naming and a holding of that abuser, of that bully, of that offender, accountable for bad actions. But this letting go of, of true forgiveness, as, as Jesus is talking about today, means that a new future can be opened, that the past has closed off. With that, and with that release, you see, with that letting go of the past, it, it's designed to allow for a new beginning, a new start. A future is opened. When I think of stories of forgiveness, there is a story I recall that comes out of the truth and reconciliation, the South African Truth and uh, um, Reconciliation Commission that was set up in South Africa after years of apartheid had been dismantled. Now, as many of you know, apartheid was the legalized separation of races in that country for many years. And after it had been dismantled, how would they move forward? How could they have a future? 
Well, in order to move forward, that country did something amazing. They set up hearings called Truth and Reconciliation, in which the persons to whom, I mean, horrific atrocities under apartheid had been committed would be in the same room with the very persons who had committed those horrific atrocities face to face. Here's a picture, South Africa, truth and reconciliation. Face to face, hearing the confession of the perpetrators. Now, one such story, true story from this time, was of a frail black South African woman over 70 years old who sat across in that courtroom from the white security officer by the name of Mr. Vanderbroek. Now, Mr. Vanderbroek had just been tried and found guilty of the murders of both this woman's son and her husband some years prior. And it was indeed Mr. Vanderbroek who was responsible for the killing and burning of her son and for the capture and the beating and the death and the burning of her husband, the only family she had. And now this woman stands in that courtroom and listens to the confession offered by Mr. Vanderbroek. And a member of the commission then turns to this woman and says, so what do you want? How can justice be done to this man who has so brutally destroyed your family? I want three things. This woman began calmly but confidently. First, I want to be taken to the place where my husband's body was burned so that I can gather the dust and give his remains a, a decent burial. She paused and then continued. My husband and son were the only family I had. So therefore, secondly, she went on, secondly, I would like Mr. Vanderbroek to become my son. And I would like him to come twice a month to the ghetto and spend time with me so that I can pour out on him whatever love I have left remaining within me. And then finally, she said a third thing. I would like Mr. Vanderbroek to know that I offer him my forgiveness because Jesus died to forgive. And this was the wish of my husband as well. And so I would kindly ask someone to come to my side and lead me across this courtroom so that I can take Mr. Vanderbroek in my arms and embrace him and let him know that he is truly forgiven. And at this point, it was reported that Mr. Vanderbroek, so overwhelmed with what he had just heard, fainted. And the members in that courtroom began singing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, I know when I want to hang on to that grudge or nurse that grudge, oh, I hear a story like this South African woman, and I am humbled in that story of a woman who knew her Lord, Jesus Christ, as a Lord of forgiveness, our servant king, who went to the cross and there declared, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And that forgiveness has been declared over you and you and me. What will transform us? Will it be evil? Will it be get back? Or will it be God's mercy? The living Lord comes again today bestowing complete forgiveness for our sin. We don't deserve it. But God is gracious. Lavishly. Generously. So that we may live generously in forgiveness. I don't know if you've noticed, but starting this weekend, we have new prayer slips in our chair backs. 
and they look like this. You may want to just gr grab one or take one out if you could find one. This is what we're inviting people to write prayers that you bring up at communion time. You'll notice on the right-hand side of that prayer slip is this logo of the weeping tree. And it corresponds with this visual of the weeping tree here to the right of the altar. Because it is here we lay down our burdens and know that our only hope is in a God of mercy and grace. Is there someone who needs your forgiveness? Is there someone with whom you need to be reconciled? I would invite you to pray. Maybe it's just put, it, put that down today. Maybe you've never done a prayer slip in worship, and we're using this in Lent. I invite you to, to do that. Or anybody who needs that new future opened up, that the past would not hold them back but to be released in God's mercy and have a new day, a new start. For that is God's desire for us. We are the beloved of God, redeemed and chosen and sent, transformed by God's forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.